Welcome back to another episode of Containers from the Couch. My name is Meish. We have a very interesting episode today. We keep on saying that we are customer obsessed in AWS and in Amazon. And of course, what better way to show that than highlighting and showcasing one of our customers. Andrew, would like to welcome you to the show. Thank you very much for joining us. Would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Andrew Hammond. I'm a uh, cloud platform engineer at ClickUp. And uh, yeah, I, I, I do an awful lot of stuff in the cloud and have been for some time now. Cool. Um, and my name is May Silo Casing. I'm a developer advocate with ECS Service Team. You see me here every now and again, and you're going to see me again tomorrow because we have another session as well, which I have not posted yet, but I will do soon soon after this, after this session as well. Welcome to everybody joining us. If you're newcomers, please say hello. Say hi, Eeyore. Thank you very much for saying hello in the chat. If you would like to let us know where you're coming from, that would be awesome. Um, Andrew, first let me ask the question. What is ClickUp? What All right. do you do? So um, I've got this quote directly from our marketing guys. So I'm going to get it right. Cool. Okay. ClickUp is a productivity platform that combines all your essential tools and features in one place. Uh, if you've been working in technology for a long time, like maybe like I have, um, ClickUp lets you get away from Jira. And that's it? Or it does a lot of... Oh, it does all kinds of other it. stuff too. But if you're a software guy and you've been like working in Jira for decades and you're like, you know, it's the devil you know, but it is a devil. It lets you get Correct. off of that. It's, it's actually a viable alternative, which is amazing. Cool. Yeah. I would I actually haven't used the product before. Me, to me, it's like, oh, no more Jira. <laughs> that was a big deal for me. <laughs> nice. And you said something about a cloud platform team. What, what platform. do you mean? Okay, so you've probably heard the phrase DevOps back in the day. And what DevOps is, is there's a lot of definitions for that. But at the very minimal definition, you take operational stuff and you apply developer, you know, the sort of software development approach to it and start doing some automation. Cloud platform is when you realize that, well, if you're automating stuff for an ops team, you still have an ops team. And that means that you're taking all these different developer squads and funneling everything down into one ops team who's supposed to do everything for everyone. And that doesn't scale. You have that classic end to one scaling pattern, which never works. So well, what, what can you do? All right, well, if you're already building automa automation, well, how can you ship as much of that stuff up to your development teams as possible. And if you go full on cloud platform, um, your DevOps team no longer does very much operations. What they're doing instead is building the automation necessary and the libraries and all the software necessary for your development teams to be able to do all of that operation stuff without violating you know, all the reasons why you'd have an ops team in the first place. So okay. all of your accountability, control, all that stuff, um, if you can build automation that allows them to achieve those checkboxes, then you don't have to funnel down into a single ops team anymore. And that means that you can scale faster. And I kind of, I like that analogy. And I also have a kind of thing of like, you're kind of the people that build the cars that people can drive around without having to worry exactly how a car works pretty much. Oh, you, it's the class. You definitely understand what the car is gears and you have to tune it on and the air conditioning yeah, yeah. works, your windows open up and down. Like you're trying to take this, this bunch of complexity and hide it inside of something. So if you've done object-oriented programming, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's the exact same mindset except applied to, okay, well, how do we make it so that all of that operational difficulty just goes away? In other words, what is ClickUp specific? What is your company's specific undifferentiated heavy list lifting? You're going to recognize yep. that phrase. Yes, we do. <laughs> we yeah. use it a couple so, of times a day. Well, yeah. And so you've got all this heavy lifting. This is the undifferentiated heavy lifting that AWS provides. And then you apply your, you know, your company's layer of undifferentiated heavy lifting on top of it. That's cloud platform. Yeah. Cool. And what do you do in the cloud platform team? Do you run the... I am an individual contributor. Um, yeah. I built most of it. <laughs> Um, at least <laughs> the initial pieces of it, uh, and uh, convinced folks to try it, <laughs> and uh, it's and it awesome. they're using it, I assume. We, Otherwise, we wouldn't be here we, on the call. On the call, we, we built it off of it, and then uh, it was a we built it, and they came. Um, the reason they came is because we had a we had to do a major migration. 
we got to the point where we exhausted our legacy infrastructure and the pattern, the patterns there were just like, we, we were just suffering at that point. And in order to continue progressing, um, we simply needed to get off of that legacy infrastructure. So, so tell me a little bit about your legacy infrastructure. I assume it is like most of our legacy people that have a legacy infrastructure, big applications sitting on monoliths and deployed once upon a time on physical servers and went evolved into virtual machines and then to EC2 instances and other kind of things. But how did it start for ClickUp? So it started for ClickUp with Elastic Beanstalk. Um, you know, it was uh, you had your founder and your co-founder. The co-founder was a guy who'd done some software and the founder was a guy who, you know, had this idea. And the guy who'd done some software was like, well, AWS is, you know, the cloud provider. And that was sort of kind of, in my opinion, capital is the capital D cloud provider. It's, it's you know, it's the 800 pound gorilla in the room and for good reason. Anyhow, so he, he knew about this and he found Elastic Beanstalk and, and he used it and it worked. And then, you know, we just kept using it. So we grew out to having a, a lot of Elastic Beanstalks and a lot of infrastructure was all hand rolled um, with no infrastructure as code, no, very little automation. Um, so it worked and it, it got the company to like a four, I think it was $4 billion valuation. Um, but at that point, like we needed to continue growing and that was just not a model that was scaling. So I assume you went to ECS, otherwise again, we wouldn't be on the show. We're talking about okay. it today. So tell so me how that journey with, worked. And we went with, e, we went with ECS and we went with ECS and we leveraged, um, we leveraged, we went heavy on the infrastructure's code approach for this. And we went, almost 100% on the idea that we're going to go with the cloud, uh, a sort of a, a platform-based approach. Um, and the development teams are the ones who are going to own the actual software, the applications, the, the CDK applications that are deploying that code, their services get deployed to the cloud using their code. And that we manage simply the libraries that sit underneath that. Okay, and for those of the viewers which might not be very much aware of CDKs, the Cloud Development Kit, it is a infrastructure as code, um, I would say, service language which allows you to describe your infrastructure, translates it eventually into in, into cloud formation, but it allows you to use any, well, most of the programming languages that you're currently um, familiar with, Python, Go, .NET, um, Java, TypeScript. TypeScript. So our developers are most of our backend, I think almost all of our backend is written in TypeScript. Um, we have some legacy JavaScript that hasn't been TypeScriptified, but that's considered like, we need to fix that. We are a TypeScript shop. And that means when I use CDK, that means when I bring in a developer, I'm not teaching them, you know, HCL for Terraform. And I don't have to convince them to install plugins in their browser and all that other stuff. And it's just TypeScript. And from the developer experience, they, they go in there and like, okay, well, it's some code and, oh, well, you know, my browser's got all the, you know, all the, the doc string hinting and all that type hinting. It's just, it's a very native experience for developers. Yeah. Um, there are pluses and minuses to that. The big plus is that your velocity of adoption is extremely high. The amount of time you have to spend training developers is orders of magnitude less than any other time I've done this in the past. And you said, any other time you've done this in the past? I assume it's not your first. Oh no, this is my first around the block. <laughs> uh, this was my fourth, um, fourth lift and shift to uh, to containerization, um, and my second move into ECS. Um, we picked ECS uh, mostly because it's managed. It's extremely managed. Um, the only really all, real alternative was going to be a uh, Kate or Kubernetes. Um, and the challenge with Kubernetes is not scaling up, it's scaling down. This is the, and control plane maintenance, but that's a whole other question. Um, scaling down is the real driver here. We want to be able to deploy, you know, per squad development environments, possibly even ephemeral per developer environments, and be able to even go a smaller green than that. So a developer could have a per pull request development environment. That's the end okay. goal. In order to be able to get there, you need to be able to scale down to it ideally free tier, but as small as you possibly can. And ECS Fargate is amazing for that. So, so tell me why. Why is it? Why, why did you find it so useful to use ECS Fargate as part of your development work cycle? What so are the benefits all, you got from it? Like I said, it's it's highly managed. You're not 
spinning up a bunch of bare metal or managing your bare metal fleet. If you're going ECS Fargate, you have no bare metal involved. And so that eliminates that entire ops team who's going to have to manage your bare metal. Well, if you've yeah. eliminated an ops team, well, you've really, what you've really done is you've delegated the heavy lifting over to AWS, which is great. And just pay them to do that. It's less expensive than doing it yourself every single time for any scale level, which is beyond, you know, very like small to medium at very large scales. Okay. Maybe you want to manage a fleet because maybe that's cost effective, but even then that's an argument you're going to have to have for scaling down to support multiple small, like very microscopic development environments. There is simply no argument for it. There's no way you can do that and be cost effective at, um, any other in any other technology that I'm aware of uh, until you get into things like serverless. But if you're running Docker containers, then probably CS Fargate is your, your best option. Okay. That's good to hear. It's actually the reason why we actually built the service. Of course, the fact is the, as you say, removing the heavy lifting from our customers of managing infrastructure and concentrating, as you say, on developing, delivering value, which is writing applications and code for your end customers as well. Right. And the other thing I love about it is it, um, it abstracts away a lot of what I think are distractions. Um, you'll have folks saying, oh, well, it's the it's the hardware under this, you know, it's that the hardware and blah, blah, blah. But, and they they, they, they want to focus down on like, okay, well, what's what megahertz CPU is it running? And you're like, that's not how you optimize code. Like if you're working at that level, if you're focusing on that, you are probably you're probably polishing Chrome and you're not going to achieve major benefits. If you're looking at your algorithmic level and saying things like, okay, well, how can we change this to make it asynchronous or how can we, that's where you're going to see your big wins. And so with Fargate, that information is just gone. It's like, it runs on a computer and it, you, it's none of your business what it runs on. It runs on something reasonably fast, architect your stuff and then scale it appropriately. And then all of a sudden your engineers stop wasting their time on something that frankly, is never going to give them a major win. And they do focus on the things that will give them major wins. Yep, exactly. So you talked about tooling which you build for, can you tell us a little bit more about what kind of tooling we're talking about with your, your cloud platform team within ClickUp? All right. So if you are a developer who comes in and you have a service you want to spin up, then there are a number of ways you can do that. But largely what it really comes down to is you're going to be either working in a GitHub repo that already exists because your, your squad has already spun up, you know, a repository that's managing a service and your service is very closely coupled to that service. And so, um, and you're going to hear me say this phrase a lot, your blast radius uh, for these two services is basically identical. And so it's okay to put them all in the same bucket. All right, fine. So put them in the same repo and manage their deploys at the same time. Or if it's a completely new system, which doesn't have a close, like a close cousin, then you're going to create a new repository, a new GitHub repository for that. Now, this is your classic multi-repo approach. And the classic counter argument to the multi-repo approach is, okay, but like, how are you going to manage all of your workflows? And aren't you going to end up in the sort of the classic fork and diverge model where everyone yeah. forks the same basic template repo and then everything diverges all over the place and you have a mess. Um, and the, the, the one word answer to that is progen, which is uh, we've talked about AWS CDK, which is a clever tool for writing really, really big cloud formation templates. Well, progen is a clever tool for managing all of your sort of boilerplate stuff that you end up inside of a Git repository. So that can be anything from a code owner's file or a license file through to this is where it's Git. It's interesting is the .github slash workflows directory. And that's where all of your CI is managed. And Here's the best part is we get all that CI basically for free. We didn't write it. I didn't write hardly a bit of it. Um, you've got guys like Ella Ben Israel, one of the core authors of AWS CDK. He wrote some of that. And then it's been maintained by a, a huge team of open source engineers. And that code is managed by a progen, which means that when they over time find improvements to the workflows, like they they did some tweak around how your build is going to, whatever. I, I don't need to know and I don't need to care. It's managed. And then I just pull the update to Progen in and it, that library update, it's a library update, mind you, manages the entire stream. It, it just ripples right out. And so the vast majority of the work that your cloud platform team is doing is managing libraries and nagging people about applying their renovate PRs. That's it. If only that was that simple, but... 
I, well, I assume you. Sure, there are well, you probably it is. Do you want to show us? Yeah, why not? Um, did you want to throw the screen? Yeah, let me share your screen and see. Let's have a look. All right. Okay, so this is a uh, this is a repository, one of those dedicated repositories. Oh, I'm clicking on the screen share part here, huh. and you can see it's got um, a handful of files in here. But the sort of the brains of it are this um, is this one file that describes the actual instance, and you can see they take a a, a base class, and as I mentioned, you've got your um, you've got all of your type hints. So this is all library code that we wrote as a team. And for example, this app with injection based instance is a deprecated class. And so they're going to eventually migrate off of that. Um, and, and you can see there's it's the, the communication layer between the cloud platform team and the development teams is via libraries, heavily via libraries. Obviously, you know, we're, we're socializing things via Slack and we've got the, the classic design process and, and, you know, architecture review process, but. And you're when, drinking coffee every now and again together oh, and speak to each other sometimes yeah, yeah. probably as well. Yeah. Yeah, but when the rubber meets the mode, where the rubber meets the road is right here in this actual code. And right here, you can see, you can do things like you can mark it deprecated and you've got all of your documentation here for what that class gives you. And so then they just super class it and do a little bit of overrides. So this is all stuff like, okay, well, what path in the ALB will this handle? All right. And um, that's mostly it. And after that, you have to, they have to decide, okay, well, where do they want to deploy to? And so it comes down to a file that looks like this. This is their pipeline.ts file. And this measure, this, uh, this file generates and manages their AWS CDK pipeline. Uh, CDK pipelines are a layer of abstraction above AWS code pipeline. Um, I don't love code pipeline. I don't think it's got a great UX. I don't think it's, you know, an amazing best in class product. What I do think is that AWS is the vendor we already have. It costs me something like what? I've got over a hundred code pipelines running right now. And my annual bill is like what? 10 or $15,000 is nothing. Versus if you compare that to Harness <laughs> um, or literally any of the other SaaS producers who are going to manage your, 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 your continuous delivery, um, and you say 100 pipeline or 100 pipelines deploying across in this case you've got uh, QA staging and production environments across god i don't even remember how many regions and you know they're sharded inside the regions this represents this file here represents probably about um 20 or 30 containers being deployed and managed or sorry and ECS servers i don't even know how many or ecs services and i'm not sure i don't even know how many containers how many tasks inside yeah, the tasks inside, I don't know, but the actual specific services, that, the task definitions that you're going to be touching, uh, you're looking at 20-ish, 20 20-odd 20 with a, a service like this. And that's like one service. And again, as you said, all this is managed in code, in TypeScript, which your developers are used to. And you have your... The argument is that it's managed in code and largely imported at the library level. So all the details, this entire repo is... I did the math beforehand... Uh, 450 lines of code plus another 800 lines of code of test. So not a lot. And then that yeah. relies on library repos. So you've got a library, one of the libraries involved here. Um, this library here uh, weighs in at 6,000 lines of code and it's got 8,000 lines of code of test. Um, the, this library do, 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 do here has a, also, uh, it has 8,000 lines of code and 10,000 lines of code of test. Um, and the reason I'm mentioning the test here is uh, one of the killer features of CDK is it it's providing testability as a first tier feature. That means that it's designed to be tested. Your software developers have at least heard of and probably have written a significant number of, you know, of unit tests. Being able to yeah. unit test your infrastructure as code means that they can start doing things like, okay, well, I've got this one thing that's I'm going to write tests to prove that it provides this certain level of functionality. And on this other side, I'm going to have this other service that consumes the things that are provided over here. And I'm going to write tests to prove that it's consuming exactly those things. And all of a sudden, you can have a contractual relationship between services and you can enforce it at the unit test layer. Um, that's huge. 
it means that you're not sort of guessing about infrastructure as code anymore. Um, and that allows development teams to do things like, okay, well, we're going to, you know, work together on getting our test, like our tests nailed down. And then we're going to say, okay, well, we've got an agreement. And as long as nobody changes these tests, well, it's going to work. <laughs> and then it actually does, which um, tends to spin heads which around. It's always awesome. It's always <laughs> awesome when that happens. So, so we got a question from the chat from uh, OCD Gamer. Have you considered using Terraform either in conjunction or as a replacement for CDK? Oh, yeah, absolutely. We do use Terraform. We use Terraform as well. We, um, where we don't use Terraform is when we expect our developers to, to do the lifting. And it's an option for developers if they want to pursue Terraform. Um, the downsides of Terraform are that Terraform's got what a, I've been I've been using it for something like God, maybe eight or 10 years. This is a long time anyways. Uh, HCL is not a language you want to introduce a TypeScript developer to or literally any other developer unless they're really, really determined to learn it. Um, when you bring a developer over to working in infrastructure as code, they have a couple of learning curves they have to address. First of all, they have to actually learn how AWS works under the hood. Like they have to understand, well, what is an IAM role and what are all these permissions and all that stuff? Um, that's a lot of work. So that's a significant curve. If you then add, you know, a, a domain specific language like HCL and HCL is not in my personal opinion, a super pretty language. That's yet another learning curve. And when you multiply learning curves together, you end up with, you know, it's a higher barrier to entry and you're going to spend a lot more time dealing with bugs. Also, um, I think one of the places where CDK really shines uh, over Terraform is in raising the, uh, the semantic level of how you're going to do your IAM. A lot of times you're going to spend, if you're, if you're a Terraform developer, you know what I'm talking about. You spend a lot of time on the AWS website looking up the specifics. Oh, well, I have to grant this specific thing and that. You know, you're, you're, you're looking up the magic, the little magic tokens that you have to put into your, um, your JSON blob or wherever you're codifying your IAM. Uh, with CDK, you can do that. Absolutely. If you need to get down to that level of granularity, you can, it's, it's easy to do. However, uh, chances are you're going to be using a higher level of granularity. You're going to say, well, I've got an S3 bucket and I'm going to want to grant read to a, a service role. And that's it. It's just my bucket dot grant read. And you're done. Um, it creates all know, the IEM policies, attaches the right things to the correct things. It makes it a lot easier to write IAM correctly. And it, it hides a lot. It encapsulates a lot of the complexity there. Uh, there are obviously edge cases. Um, one of the challenges I think that CDK has in its future to address is uh, supporting the use of ABAC. So when you start to scale out to being a larger company, you start to have challenges around the size of your policies. Like they start to get really big because you're like writing in thousands and thousands of lines of this, that, and the other thing. And so you start to say, okay, well, how do you scale that? And you get over to attributes that... Uh, Attribute-based access control, so ABAC. Mostly people are using tags for this, right? Um, and you're saying, okay, I'm going to decide who gets access to my resource in the resource policy, and I'm going to say that you should never have to write a change. You should never have to do a direct grant inside of a role so that the service that the role's under, it just has some tags on it, but it doesn't really have a lot granted directly to it. And then your your, your other resources have are managing the actual access directly in the resource policy. That still isn't a super easy thing to do in any, I mean, first of all, it's not a super easy thing to do in general, but it's not, CDK is not making that enormously easier. And I would, I don't know how that would quite work because I haven't sat down and spent, you know, a bunch of time thinking about it, but I, I can sort of sort of think that that's a, a would be a juicy area to really uh, differentiate as well. So firstly, you, of course, I assume you're aware of the CDK um, Slack channel and um, oh, yeah. which is actually very, 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 very popular and open source for the, yeah. actually, the whole CDK, of course, is completely open source. The community is very, um, I would say, accommodating with new suggestions. So if you have any thoughts, of course, you're already well, yeah, doing that, so you can already go there is and getting, um, is getting your PRs uh, reviewed all the way to merged in the CDK repo uh, because AWS's team there. I think they should have more developers working on CDK because they've got a few and they're really great guys and, and, and gals, sorry. They're really great people and um, there's not enough of them. 
<laughs> so I will pass that information back onto the product manager. I'm sure they'll be happy no, to give you the feedback. Them, I'm like, you guys, you are people on your team. Uh, send it up to the scale. Tell Jeff. So I've got a question for you, specifically ECS. How can you kind of walk me through how this actually works on the ECS perspective from your Progen project? Right. So as I said, the project is Progen. So here's your Progen RC. And so it describes, well, what are your dependencies? And that's it. Right? And then you run Progen, and that renders all kinds of files. So it'll manage your package.json file extensively. Uh, it instantiates your CDK++. Hey, Randall. <laughs> uh, it extend, it, it, it uh, manages, for example, our renovate.json file. Uh, this guarantee this is how we make sure that those those library updates are coming through on a regular basis um, and then in order to actually deploy a service they're going the, the developers are going to as i say they're going to pick one of these classes that's published by uh by our cdk ecs fargate library this this library is where we apply all of clickup's opinions we have a lot of opinions about how we're going to run containers how we're going to do tagging, how we're going to do, for example, uh, we use Datadog. So how are we using Datadog? Um, all of that stuff, um, all of the sidecar definitions, all of the way that the, uh, all the way that we handle, for example, if they want to have ephemeral storage attached and how they want to do that, that's all managed in this library. And they become just very easy things to go with. Oh, well, just going to go with the defaults. And then that makes it easy for them to do the right thing. For example, if you're deploying an S3 bucket at ClickUp, um, we ask that you use the CDK library version of, a, of an S3 bucket. So that would be, a, and then you would do, Something like that. And then there are obviously things you'd want to do differently here. You'd probably want to give it a name and you might want to do some permissions granting this, that, and the other thing. But because you've pulled the S3 bucket from our CDK library, so this is sort of the CDK library provides some very baseline level things. Because you're pulling it from there, you know as a developer that all of your compliance requirements are handled. So it's encrypted at rest and it's got public access blocked on it. And these are things that otherwise you would have to know about and set up correctly yourself. And that is, um, that's a huge problem. Now, any IAC language can achieve this by going with either a library or modular based approach, specifically Terraform, you're using Terraform modules. Um, the downside with the Terraform approach is, boy, you've got to do a lot of copy pasta when you're doing Terraform modules. And also it's, you're not going to be able to get things like Oh my God, I've got a cat trying to crowd onto my lap. Well, maybe the cat can give us a new insight into how ECS works, but maybe not. We'll see. <laughs> Doing that wrong. Maybe I we will... should call it a new one, which is called cat formation, as Dale Church says. Cat formation. Okay. So you do something like this, for example. I was mentioning about how IAM gets easier. So this is an example of, for example, granting the ability for uh, the execution role to run the delete on some bucket that you create. Um, let's see, I can also, I'm gonna have to pop open another terminal here for a sec. So, so while you do that, I have one question or maybe something to clarify. In CDK, we have what we call different level constructs. A level one is what we call a, a one-to-one -one mapping with all the cloud formation primitives. The second one is a level two construct, which is something which AWS has created, which gives you same defaults. For example, you want to create an ECS cluster. You have a ECS construct, which allows you to do that and makes it very, very simple to deploy an ECS cluster and your tasks and auto scaling everything with inside. The third level is what I think, you know, if, I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, what you have implemented over here is you just say your opinionated ClickUp specific configuration for each and every service. In this case, your S3 service or your ECS service or whatever your load balancing, everything over there, you've invested as the cloud platform team. 
that work in order to make everything the way you want it to be. And then you just give it to everybody that wants to consume it and allows them very easily, just as you say, import it. And they've got everything ready for them. With, and get, yet you say all that heavy lifting has already been done for somebody from them for them. Yep. Um, and one of the key features of this is you'll end up with, you, obviously, you're always going to have a spectrum of developers. You're going to have that sort of normal distribution. You've got developers sort of in the center where they they understand it, they're competent and stuff like that. You've got developers off on one edge who are going to struggle with it. And that's, that's okay. And you're going to have to support them. But then you're going to have developers off on the other side who really dig it. And they get into it and they want to do cool stuff. And in that case, you just point them at your libraries and say, yeah, please, pull requests accepted um, and greatly appreciated. And they do that. Um, if you look at, let me throw up a window here, GitHub, uh, click up Progen. We mentioned Progen before, and I'm using it specifically because it's an open source library for this example. But you're going to see our uh, contributors here We've got like 22 contributors and the cloud platform team is not 22 people. In fact, all of so infrastructure- you've automatically scaled your team by a factor of a good number of three, four or five. Well, you, what you've done is you've allowed developers to scratch their itch to use uh, old school open source terminology. All those developers who like, oh, well, there's this one thing that's mildly annoying me. I, I'd love to be able to do this. Uh, uh, I'm going to, Specifically call out Morgan Safransky because he's awesome and he contributed some really great stuff. Thanks, Morgan. Oh, my God. This is just to our, our ClickUp Progen stuff. So if you are, for example, using if you're doing CDK and you're using CDK pipelines for continuous delivery and you're using Progen's CI stuff for your continuous integration, you're going to be like, well, I'm in the CI layer and I want to do a CDK diff to see what the net effect is. And there's not really anything that supports that out of the box. <laughs> except here there is, we, we provide, uh, <coughs> you know, we, we include ability to, you know, manage CDK diffs. So you just, here's the, here's the doc on how do you implement CDK diff for your project by leveraging the stuff that's already in really cool. and it's, it's pretty easy. You're just saying, okay, well, these are the environments. So I'm going to create an OIDC uh, connector and off you go. Um, uh, once we convinced the security guys to install OADC support, uh, that sort of opened the floodgates for us to do some cool stuff. Uh, for example, uh, if you're deploying across multiple accounts and in multiple regions and you're sort of doing that sort of very widespread uh, approach, one of the things you're going to have to do is manage your CDK context.json file. Well, that's not fun uh, because the traditional way to do it is you say, oh, well, I'm going to add a deploy to this region. So I'm going to go on my laptop and, and I'm going to basically do those lookups from my, my account as a developer. And that means that whoever your developer is has to have administrative access into that region. You can imagine how okay. that's going to fly with your security team. Probably so not well. It's centralized back to your ops team. All of a sudden you've got the classic scaling problem because you know, you've got 20 something of these other teams all scaling down. So it doesn't work really well. Okay. Well, what if we provide the ability to do the, the, the lookups in, we give that ability to your, uh, we give that ability to your build job in GitHub. Well, all of a sudden, um, it can do the lookups and it applies those into your CDK context.json file. Um, all of your uh, progenified CI workflows for your PRs support a concept of self mutation. So they're saying things like, okay, well, if I run lint and I make a bunch of changes that are lint based, I should just like create a, you know, a, self, a, a self mutation merge or self mutation commit and apply them to myself. Well, it, it works for context the CDK context.json too. So now you have an automatically updating CDK context.json file whenever you add a new region or a new account that you're deploying to. Cool. So it's That's uh, pretty amazing. It's all stuff like that. Um, yeah. <clears throat> it's uh, the goal here is to make it as self serve as we can possibly make it. Well, at the same time, like retaining all the, you know, Control the guardrails. Um, yeah, the guardrails. Um, without having to go and write a whole lot of guardrails. Um, well, well you did write them up, but they're all physically, they're in code. And they're, of course, through a pipeline and managed. And you can, of course, update them based as needed, based on your yeah. requirements if you need to change something. Yeah. <clears throat> so we got a question from Randall, um, which or a comment, I think. And I would actually be very interested in when you, on your um 
Um, your thoughts? The, str the, the thing of using CDK or at least uh, level, th layer, layer, level three or layer three constructs in CDK is the fact that you try to sometimes, it's difficult to find the correct level of abs abstraction. How much do you leave to the layer, the defaults provided by AWS? And how much do you customize exactly to what you have? Because once you start customizing, they're yours from the time you release them until CDK stops to exist or your company is funnily acquired by who knows whatever and everybody goes on vacation to Hawaii. <laughs> but how do you, um, where do you, how, how are you able to manage to draw that line? Okay, so there, that, um, I've been working with CDK for four, I guess it's going on five years now. So back when it was very new, um, I, I picked up on that really early. So I'm really lucky on that front. So I've over time managed to get myself at least something of a sense for where the right boundaries are. And this is opinion, pure opinion, but it seems to be working. And I don't know how you go from turning this into opinion to a hardcore best practice. Um, I think that the best way to build things in CDK is to try and keep your places where you're applying opinion very sort of very localized. So we do have some L3 constructs that sort of weave together a lot of really big pieces. But one of our goals is to say, well, yeah, well, you're weaving together really big pieces. But for example, like the S3 bucket example, that one little piece is managed over somewhere else. And so if your opinion about that changes, then that one thing is reused across everywhere that uses an S3 bucket. And it doesn't blow up this other big L3 construct, which has a lot of opinion in it. So okay. you, keep your, you sort of, you want to keep that localized. Um, the term blast radius keeps coming to mind. Well, how can you manage the blast radius for a change to this? If you change your opinion about how you want to be, uh, what your compliance requirements are for an S3 bucket, how do you make sure that the blast radius for that is minimized? How do you make sure that everything that needs that one thing is getting it all from the same place? So you want to sort of find what your, what your sort of smallest unit is. And if you, what seems to work reasonably well is look at, an L2 construct and say, okay, well, that L2 construct probably encapsulates a reasonable amount of stuff for one service. And if you want to apply opinion, then superclass that and just make the smallest possible change you can there. Um, let me, did my screen share drop? I bet it did. Yeah, we can share it again. Just a sec. Uh, and I'm going to pop into and show the actual code for what our S3 buckets look like. What happened there? And I'm having a little fun with uh, GitHub today. All right, well. <clears throat> So while you're looking there, actually, um, I hope I'm putting the right correct. It's Armadon 101 asked the question was to, on your, your um, as we say, the delineation of where, you, how far you abstract. So you're talking about blast radius for your components that you want to bind to the last same life cycle? Um, you're talking about blast radius for components, yes. So you want to make sure that when you make significant changes to a component, first of all, that should probably be happening in a library and that library is going to be version, you're going to follow standard semver for it. If you're making a really big change that breaks backwards compatibility, that's going to be a major version rev. And then you're leveraging tools like Renovate, for example, that recognize the difference between minor and patch level version changes versus a major version rev. And they're going to create a, a PR that just handles that one library change if you're going to do a major rev. And then your consumers are going to see that, oh, well, there's a major rev on that particular library. Okay. Well, I'm going to go look at that. Probably their test blew up if it, you know, if, if that is a major change that's going to break them. And they're going to have to go in and address those things in their PR for pulling that version, the major rev of your library. And that's how you control your adoption. And then you can use tools like um, GitHub projects. So one of the things you'll see in our ClickUp ProGen stuff is it will automatically register all of your renovate PRs with a specific GitHub project. So it keeps track in that project of literally all the renovate PRs. And then when you're trying to do compliance work on the, the cloud platform side or on the security side, 
they go into that project and they're like, okay, well, which teams haven't pulled this particular library to this particular version that I care about? So it gives you a lot of compliance tooling as well. We also are right in the process right now of adopting um, OctaHerd, which allows you to do uh, basically to run TypeScript, uh, TypeScript scripts uh, spread across all of your uh, GitHub, well, whatever subset of GitHub repos you want to run across. Um, and that sort of gives you a very general purpose tool for like very specific reporting or automating certain actions. Um, it's terrifyingly cool. So present, share screen, share screen, entire screen number one. Here we go. So this is what our S3 bucket opinions look like. Yeah. And it literally says, take an AWS S3 bucket and say, when you run the super class. So first of all, it says, hey, if, uh, if you say the bucket should be unencrypted, then uh, you must get an error. It blows up. <laughs> And our developers go, oh, we must encrypt our buckets. Okay, cool. And then it applies all kinds of other opinion by default, and they can override a lot of these opinions, but it sort of gives them a reasonable set to go from. And this you have for all the specific opinionated classes that you have. <laughs> this is an ex this is a really small example for an opinionated class because an S3 bucket is everyone knows what an S3 bucket is, and everyone knows that, well, you probably want to block public access, you probably want to enable encryption, because you know. You're going to have yep. all these standard requirements that are coming out of your security and your compliance team. And boom, there's one place you can put them. And all of a sudden, it makes it easy for everyone to do it right, by, you know, just to do it right by default. Um, doing, you know, intelligent tiering, for example, um, that's just a stupid, easy way to save some money. And for the majority of teams, it just works. And they don't care. So let's save some money. So let's make that the default. Cool. Very nice. Um, there's a couple more questions which came on um, from the chat. Um, um, Armand101 asked the question, do you have any, um, of course, Terraform and Pulumi and all these kind of other things have a lot of adoption and each of them have their own place in every single different developers, I would say, toolbox. Do you have any insight of why um, CDK worked better for you, specifically for ClickUp? The doc strings are phenomenal. AWS's, AWS CDK's documentation is best in class. I have never seen anything close to it. It's really good. Um, there are edge cases, obviously. Like, for example, if you want to work with MSK, um, uh, CloudFormation support for MSK is terrible. And so that, honestly, that's the worst part about CDK is that it relies on CloudFormation. CloudFormation. Uh, CloudFormation really has some, some rough edges. Um, we just spent two weeks dealing with a bug in CloudFormation, where CloudFormation assumes that AWS IAM roles and AWS I, IAM users, but IAM roles particularly, that the tagging behavior on IAM roles is the same as the tagging behavior everywhere else. Everywhere else in AWS that I know of, when you apply a tag, the key for the tag is its name, and the key for the tag is case sensitive, period, end of story. With roles, okay. it preserves case, but it smashes case when it decides the identity of the tag. CloudFormation says, okay, well, so I'm going to deploy two tags. I'm going to deploy tag foo with a capital F. And I'm going to deploy tag foo with no capitals. Deploys that off to IAM. IAM says, oh, well, you've got tag foo with a capital F, and then you renamed it to tag foo with a lowercase right. f. And now you only have one tag. <laughs> oh, and then here's the really fun part is you say, oh, that's not what I wanted to do. I'm going to roll back that change. CloudFormation says, okay, I'm going to delete that one tag, tag foo. And now you have no tags. Yeah. And if you're just using your tags for decorative purposes, which, okay, some people maybe do, I don't know, but if, whatever, but if you're using your tags, for example, to manage ABAC, you're going to have a bad time. Agreed, yeah. definitely, because everything yeah. is based, of course, on every single tag that you have and who has access to what. So the number one reason we chose was driving CDK, AWS CDK is the docs. So it's TypeScript, the doc strings just appear, they pop straight up. There's no question in your mind. It's like, if you're a, a, a regular developer, you go into your VS code and the, the, the doc strings pop up, you're like, okay, this it's just another library. I'm just writing software. That's really critical if you want to achieve adoption across your development teams. You've got to keep that barrier to entry low. Number two, our cloud platform team is small. And when we scale up to go across 
dozens of development teams and we have more than a dozen development teams that are using AWS CDK, using our tooling. Um, there's not enough of us to answer all the questions, but you know what there is enough of? AWS support. And so you take your development team and you say, well, I don't know, like, is, is this a really cloud, you know, cloud, is this is a ClickUp specific, a really specific question for ClickUp or, or are you just having a general question about how you should configure your DynamoDB or how you're going to do Athena or all these, you know, any other of the other random AWS services, which they can now basically use whatever the hell they want. Like certainly there's areas where we have massive support. For example, running Docker containers in, CD, in you know, ECS Fargate, we've got an entire library dedicated to that 8,000 lines of code to get really, really nailed on it. Um, for DynamoDB tables, you know, we've got, we're using that. We've got developers who are using that. We have a little bit of support for that in our libraries. And then you've got folks who are like experimenting with, uh, they need to run DMS or this, that, whatever. And they're just doing it. And support is the one they go to, to ask their questions. So they've got this, they've got a cloud formation, they, they've got a cloud formation stack they can point support at. So there's not a whole pile of communications back and forth about what it is. And there's none of the noise and waste of time that comes with, oh, well, I have to do all this thing and gather all the information for the support guys. No, it's just right there in the stack. Um, if it's a CK, CDK implementation specific problem, there is a CDK support channel for in support. So you can send your developers there. You got to be careful because sometimes support will send them down some really dumb rabbit holes. Uh, my favorite example is how do you deal with SSM parameters that cross regions or cross accounts? The correct and only answer to this, and yes, I'm opinionated, and yes, I'm very strongly opinionated on this, is that the thing that's producing the SSM parameter that needs to be to, needs to be read must cross-region publish that parameter to the consumers. One of the answers you might get out of support because they Googled it is, oh, well, you can write a custom resource that will just go and make the query a cross-region at runtime. And, oh, well, you know, you got to make sure that that custom resource is fetching the latest version of that, so let's do a cache buster on that as well. Just like stick a timestamp in it or something like that. Well, now <laughs> you're making it a lot more complicated. Well, you make things a higher risk. You've, you've created risk. So what you've done there is now when you're running your, when you're running a consumer platform, you're running your consumer. It has no way of knowing whether or not that parameter has changed because you have to add a cache buster. So it's always saying, oh, well, when you run CloudFormation, you always you can never completely quench out all the changes. It can't just automatically detect, oh, well, nothing changed. I have nothing to do here. It always has to run that custom resource. Um, there's stuff like that. So there's edges, right? Like it's not perfect. Um, but AWS support is amazing as a force multiplier. So, yep. oh, and formations back. <laughs> Thank you. So making sure that the language is easy for them to adopt. That's really critical. Being able to leverage Oh, being able to leverage the, the the windows are reversed, and so it's very confusing to me. I look at myself like, I've got two fingers up. No, I've got. Anyways, um, being able to have it very accessible and with excellent documentation that's critical. Being able to leverage AWS support for your force multiplier, so you can you know the undifferentiated heavy lifting of supporting your developers. Hand it to AWS, give it to them. You're already paying for an enterprise contract, anyways. Well, we are. Uh, uh, literally every place I've ever worked at that's an AWS shop is paying for enterprise support. So use it and get some yep. value out of it. Um, Agreed. And then because everything really is under the hood with CDK, it's just TypeScript. Even if you're using Python, you're using JSII to render things down into TypeScript and, or to run the TypeScript that's been, that's been rendered um, at some level. So because everything's just code, you're already leveraging all of that infrastructure that already exists. You've already got GitHub to manage just plain code. And all of you've got Renovate to manage code that has libraries. Well, you, all of these problems are extremely well addressed because you're leveraging all of that infrastructure for managing code as opposed to managing, well, it's IIC special case HCL code. Well, that infrastructure layer, it exists and it's not bad, but it's nowhere near the level that you're going to see with just plain old TypeScript or JavaScript. I mean, that's orders of magnitude better supported by sort of the global open source community. Those are the two major drivers. Cool. Thank you very much. There was one other question, which I don't really think is specifically related to code, but it's more of how I would think <coughs> your ClickUp, um, I would say, culture. And the question was, um, do you employ dedicated site reliability and SREs, site reliability yes. engineers. Yep. And 
Will it be if if you do? Is it still advisable to implement CDK for businesses that are instructed or constructed into several different service teams, like or where T-shaped engineers carry responsibilities for spanning the full stack and monitoring and operations? So for monitoring and operations, for example, uh, our monitoring code, a lot of that's uh, it's Datadog specific. There's no support for that in AWS CDK. I mean, obviously you have to do your tagging in CDK and you have to deploy you know, your sidecars using CDK. So you've got your Datadog stuff managed correctly there. You're, you're, you're moved to Datadog. Um, but when it comes to actually managing Datadog itself, that's Terraform. Um, if you have an infrastructure team or if you have a DevOps team where you're going to have subject matter experts and you can reasonably say, yeah, of course, you know, Terraform, you've been working in this industry for a while. Of course. Yeah, sure. You should use Terraform or Pulumi or whatever language it is they already know. Um, that's not a cloud platform approach. And it works well with the cloud platform approach because where a cloud platform shines is when you're trying to enable development teams to do all this other stuff that's very specific to what they're doing. They want to deploy S3 buckets. They want to deploy lambdas, step functions, all that e ECS Fargate containers. They want to deploy that stuff. And they want that stuff to work. They don't even want to think about or manage all the stuff that lies underneath it. So your Datadog management, all your, your, um, your log files, man, all that stuff, the development teams want to use it. They don't want to know about it. Your SREs and your infrastructure team, your, dev your DevOps folks, that's your bread and butter. And they may use CDK to manage that. I don't care. They're, they're probably going to use Terraform, though, or they're probably going to use Pulumi because the providers for that are phenomenal. And in CDK, you would be writing custom resources. And, you know, if you've got like a tiny little edge case you have to cover, then a custom resource makes a lot of sense. And there are a lot of really great ways that uh, CDK has made custom resources way more accessible. Um, I don't know if any of you here have ever written a custom resource directly for CrowdFormation. Uh, that is an excruciating experience. Um, it, 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 CloudFormation punishes the heck out of you uh, in that process because every bug you have will break your stack and then you're going to be waiting hours for it to reset. And then you're just going to tear it down anyways because you probably already moved forward with another stack in your development environment. Uh, whereas with Terraform, you can just they can just pound forward on that. I'm not saying that CDK is better than Terraform. I'm saying that CDK is better than Terraform to solve this one problem. And of course, it's always finding the right tool for the right oh, problem, yeah, yeah, which no. is like, very specific yeah. to exactly what the problem is and who the and exactly. who the user is. If you want to go cross cloud, you're you're in the wrong area, man. Like you shouldn't be using these tooling. You should be very much focused on trying to stuff everything you possibly can into Kubernetes. Um, but if you want to go cloud native, that's a completely different thing. You you don't want to do that. You're you're aiming for AWS. Okay, great. Well, you can achieve some really amazing options there. So talking about that, we're almost coming to the end of our show. I would like to kind of close out and find out, for example, what, what were the gains that you actually got a click up from using ECS or any kind of, um, I would say, insights you would like to share with the viewers oh, here, which are bombarding uh, us with questions. And I apologize, we haven't gotten to all of them over the chat, but um, we will try to get back to you. If you either ping me afterwards, I will try and get back an answer from you, either through Andrew or if I can give it to you myself. Yeah, no, I like... I like talking about this stuff, so it's, it's always a pleasure. <laughs> um, I think our major our major win here was that it 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 unblocked us to make a very quick move off of Elastic Beanstalk and onto ECS Fargate. So that enabled us to improve our, for example, our deploy times. So we still have a monolith for some of our stuff. We're we're in the process of moving stuff out of the monolith and moving to microservices, like everyone else is or does, but we still have that legacy stuff. And, you know, it got us to a $4 billion valuation. So I'm not smack talking it, but moving forward, obviously you got to do something about that to achieve better, you know, to, to fix a lot of problems. So that thing, when you were deploying on Beanstalks, um, that was a nightmare. Uh, you're Again, you're deploying across, in our case, um, I can't remember if it's eight or nine regions back when we were doing Beanstalks. And you wanted, we wanted to move from, from that. We wanted to get, you know, we wanted faster deploys to be able to get, to get to rev that software more quickly. And we wanted more reliable deploys that didn't take a lot of time and a lot of human, in, like a lot of intervention. And so just by moving to plain old Fargate, like ECS Fargate, that went from a very flaky process to a, well, it just works process. Nice. It's good to hear. That alone paid for the move. Um, and then by achieving that velocity and the scalability, well, all of a sudden you can scale your containers up and down and you can start dynamically scaling. You can theoretically dynamically scale in Beanstalk, but the reality is that it's just too cumbersome. 
and managing your scalers and beanstalks is just terrible. Whereas in ECS, it's pretty straightforward. Um, and it mostly just works out of the box. And if you want to switch to other scaling algorithms or other load balancing algorithms, especially if you're leveraging CDK, it's really bonehead simple. Um, it, it, it unblocks that. And it also unblocks differentiation for your other teams. So they can say, oh, well, you know, these guys scale using, you know, least, you know, least outstanding requests, but we're scaling based, you know, we're doing our load balancing based on this other algorithm, like, because of the way that their software behaves. It, it, it just makes a lot of sense. Uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of like bottom line effects, uh, it saved us a pile of money because it made it easy for us to move. For example, we had to get off of node 12 because node 12 was end of life. All right, so, well, how do you do that? Well, if you're deployed using Beanstalks, you're gonna have to upgrade all your Beanstalk infrastructure. That's a, that's a little bit of a chore. Um, oh my gosh, AWS wants to turn off support for, you know, node 12. Well, I get that and I agree with that. And also we better get off of it. So, you know, that was another driver for us. And as soon as you move over to containerization, well, all of a sudden the version of node that you're running is nobody's business, but your containers. Um, yeah, it, it's it, much it more smaller then, units. Exactly. And then once you've moved to a containerized process and you've got some team that says, well, we don't want to be running this monolithic container. We want to run our own container. You're like, yeah, sure, go for it. Easy peasy. Knock yourself out. And that process becomes very easy. And then what ECS repository they're pulling from becomes a matter of, okay, well, you make a little tiny tweak in CDK, and now they're pulling from this repo instead of that. And it's done. It uh, it enables a lot of that. Uh, it enables you to, to customize without paying an enormous overhead on customization. It keeps that cost quite reasonable. Did it help you anything with your reliability of your services or your scaling oh, yeah. of your services? I mean, like the reliability went way up through the roof because instead of Beanstalk with its very clunky scaling of problems and well, clunky behavior in general when it comes to upgrades, uh, you're just running Docker containers. And so again, our monolithic Docker container, it's too fat in my opinion, and it needs to lose a little bit of weight. We're working on that. And it's too slow on startup and it needs to be more responsive and we're working on that. But it's a Docker container and for the most part, it just works. You know, you, you've got so much support for running Docker versus running like, you know, Beanstalk bare metal, which is what we had, not such a great experience. So that that in itself, just by moving to, a, you know, sort of a more modern infrastructure made a, a world of difference. And then all of that time you were spending trying to troubleshoot actual problems and having, you know, just the noise of the infrastructure occluding them. Like you don't have the noise of the infrastructure anymore. The infrastructure is behaving reliably, it's straightforward. And now you can see the real problems and you can actually fix them. And that was, that was a massive move. If you're the infrastructure team, if you're responsible for the infrastructure team, having development teams going, oh, well, you know, we've got this bug. Oh, it's an infrastructure problem. Oh, it's an infrastructure problem. Oh, it's an infrastructure problem. Because a lot of your infrastructure was hand rolled and there were a lot of, there was a lot of flake to it. And you're using legacy, you know, technologies. Yeah. You're going to get a lot of noise from that. And some of it's going to be legitimate. Like you actually have an infrastructure problem, but you're going to end up wearing the blame for a lot of stuff. You're going to be the first course of, oh, well, shift the blame off to this other team. And because you don't have that sort of really strong history of your know, infrastructure is just working and, and being able to, for example, leverage testing on your infrastructure and prove that it's accurate, like that it's correct. Well, you're going to catch a lot of noise and that's going to just, and if you've already got a team where you've got this whole bunch of other teams all centralizing down to one DevOps team, sure, that team's going to be thrashed. I apologize, we're gonna to have to stop because we're running out of our time. So firstly, I wanna thank you very, very much for your for an, a, a mind blowing session personally, because I learned a, a huge amount of things here today. Thank you very, very much. We will of course post all the links which we had here today in the show notes on YouTube and on Twitch. Well, in YouTube for sure. Twitch maybe it depends if I get to it later on today. Um, thank you very much everybody for um, joining us in the chat. Thank you very much for your interaction and your comments. Um, don't forget to hit the subscribe button on YouTube, subscribe on Twitch. We hit 100,000 subscribers on Twitch, which is a good milestone. So thank you very much. And we'll see you tomorrow on another episode. Thank you Have so a great much. Have day. I had a lot of fun. Bye, guys. Thanks a lot. Bye.